Hi, following from last video where we got the solutions for the unsymmetric infinite square well, today we're now going to look at the physical interpretations. Let's see what the mathematics tells us. What is the physical meaning for all those equations and numbers? So, where we left off was finding the solutions of the infinite unsymmetric square well, which is basically the well that we have over here. It's symmetric about a divided by 2. So, a closer look at the solutions of the potential that we have, the unsymmetric infinite square well. After applying the boundary conditions and kn is equal to m pi divided by 2, remember solving the, the trigonometry function equals to 0, so now we know k takes discrete values, we substitute that back inside the solution. So, if you were to recall the previous video, one of the boundary conditions led us to a equals to 0. That's why you can see that the cosine function is no longer here. Then we also have sine k, sine kx, but since now k we know takes discrete values and is given by n pi divided by a, we will now substitute that inside the argument over here and that is what we have. So now, a logical question would be for us to see what the probability density is. Now, we want to hold that for a minute. We know that for the bound states, we are able to normalize the probability density function. I have not sketched out the probability density function yet, but Coming along those lines, what we can now do to the solutions to the Schrodinger equation is to see whether we can normalize that. Now, the reason why we want to do that is because, in a way, yes, this is a solution, but we still don't know what the value of b is. We did not apply, or we cannot apply the continuity conditions. But instead, we can normalize this wave function and from the normalizing condition, get a value for b. Now, how are we going to normalize it? We know that the solution psi n is going to be applicable for the region where the particle can exist, basically that region over here. So we integrate from 0 to a, from 0 to a, of the function which would be b sine n pi x divided by a, we're going to take the magnitude of that because remember we're dealing with a probability density function and we're going to square that and integrate with respect to x. And this, if we want to normalize it, should equal to 1. So what it tells us is that take the probability density function, we get a certain probability density and then when we sum all of that, it needs to be equal to 1. Why? Because the probability of finding the particle around this region has to add up to 1. So this is the, the thing we need to deal with. Now, Take the magnitude of this function, magnitude of b, a constant, it will be b again. So the magnitude of b squared, our integral from 0 to a magnitude of sine n pi x divided by a is again the, the sine function. I'll square that, so I'll get a sine squared n pi x divided by a uh, dx. Okay, and we want to evaluate that. Now let us use the space over here since I no longer need the potential diagram. Now, I want to make a substitution. What is the logical substitution? Now, as you can see, we got an x over here. We want to make the argument n something, okay? So, we make a substitution y, and let y, oh, sorry, okay, x. We let x equal to a divided by pi y. Now, you see, because if I put this a divided by pi y back inside the argument over here where x is, the pi and the a will cancel out, and then I would have simply sine y. Now, okay, but what about the boundaries? This will tell us that dx would also be equal to a pi dy, so I can substitute the differential, but the boundaries where x, or the limit, sorry, where x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0, and when x is equal to a, y is equal to, the a divides out, y is equal to pi. So, this would now be left with, sorry, the right-hand side is now going to be the magnitude of b squared, I will bring out the constant by substituting the differential inside here. So I'll get an a pi and I will integrate now from 0 to pi of sine squared n y. Not bad, not bad at all. So what is that uh, integral over there? Well, we see that it's sine squared n y. Now, sine squared n y is also equal to sine n y multiplied by sine n y. Now, if you take my Fourier analysis, one of the results of these orthogonal relationships is that since sine multiplied by sine odd multiplied by odd is an even function, so we know that the integral from minus pi to pi is going to be the same. Now, if I'm going to integrate from 0 to pi, I will get the, the integral divided by 2. But what is the integral? The, the integral is now going to be given as a pi, a divided by pi. If I were to evaluate this from minus pi to pi, I will get pi, right? But since I'm integrating from 0 to pi, and we know that it's an even function, so I will get pi divided by 2, right? Uh, basically, you can just go calculate that out using standard integral formulas. Now, divide up, the, uh, cancel out the pi, and this I will ultimately get the magnitude of b squared a divided by 2. So, if I were to substitute this back inside here, 
which is now uh, a divided by 2, and I'll rearrange for b squared, the magnitude of b squared, I will ultimately get, so this will be equal to 1, b's magnitude of b squared multiplied by a divided by 2 is equal to 1, b's magnitude of b, or also b, will be given by 2 divided by a and take the square root, and since we are taking positive square roots, we will just get b is equal to a divided by 2. So the last, so ultimately the solutions of the Schrodinger equation would be given as psi n is given by 2 divided by a, the square root of that multiplied by psi n pi x divided by a. Okay, and yeah, so that's the solution that we have. So as we can see, now the bouncing solutions, we can normalize it. Using the normalizing condition, we can find the constants over here. So this corresponds to a solution, one of the solutions for the discrete value of what n is. Okay, so n equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So now let's look closely into these solutions and see what they mean. Okay, hence, okay, so I read out formally over here, hence, psi n is, in terms of x, is given by that, the energy values is also written in terms of n, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, I just want to draw to your attention to the 0 over here. It's quite important, we want to take the general case first. Later we shall find out very soon that n is only allowed certain values, or sorry, more specifically, whether n starts from 0 to 1. But, let's just put 0 inside over there. So, first thing that tells us, very simply, we end up with an infinite sequence of discrete energy values corresponding to the quantum number n. Quantum number. This term is given a, a special name. Okay, it's called a quantum number. Previously, we've been working with the wave number k. But as you can see from the solutions, the wave number k is no longer present. You see, that's why if you would like to take the study of quantum mechanics further, we are always working with certain numbers, you know. Since we have a discrete energy spectrum, we can work with the quantum number n. What value of n? We get the, the value of the energy, we get the value of the wave function. But if, if we ended up with the continuous spectrum, the continuous state or the continuous solutions, we work with the wave number k. So, just to let you know, general knowledge that now we got the discrete energy values, we are at liberty to work with the quantum number n. But what we do with that? For the study in quantum mechanics. Alright, now here is one of the crucial part. Ground state energy. I put n equals to 0 as one of the values, integer values of n. But if I put n equals to 0, what is the energy value? The energy value en, oh sorry, e0, because I'm going to evaluate n equals to 0, is now equal to 0. Now this is going to be a problem because states in quantum mechanics cannot have zero energy. This is just one of the things that if you take the, the full formalization of, of the, the Hilbert space, of you know the full formalization of quantum mechanics, you know that states cannot have zero energy. So this is really invalid, right? This is really invalid. But now, when I start as n equals to 1, what do I get? Well, basically I get e subscript 1, and then I'll just substitute 1 inside here. I'll get h bar squared n pi squared divided by 2 mass of the, the particle a squared. So now, the lowest energy of the particle is given by this over here, where n is equal to 1 and the energy value is h bar squared pi squared divided by 2 m the, uh, a squared. This is what we call the zero point energy. Zero point energy. Right? Zero point energy. So all you need to know is that the, the energy is equal to zero does not exist. So we always start when n equals to 1 because you know, the energy cannot be zero, that is what we call a zero point energy. So now what I will do is that I'll cancel the number zero over here. Hence so one, two, three, so on and so forth. Right? Okay, number three, the wave function. Now the theorem that we did not state when we are dealing with bound solutions, I'll state it now, okay? Wave functions of one dimensional bound state systems has n minus one knots if n is equal to zero is the ground state. Okay, what a handful of a theorem for us to handle. Never mind, let's explain, let's see what we can understand from here. Which is linked to the probability density function, which I, you know, that's why I want to talk about it. So, what we've just found out from number two is that n equals, to, n equals to 1 is the lowest energy value, and that is the zero point energy. So, n equals to 1 corresponds to the ground state, the ground state of the system. And the, the, we, we know from a certain theorem that the wave function, so the wave function, this wave function over here is this wave function over here, our psi n, right? The wave function of one dimensional bound state system has n minus 1 knots. Now, what are these things called knots? Knots are basically the, the areas where n is sub, n is, x is equal to a certain value in the potential and the wave function is equal to 0. So, for example, if let's just say x is equal to a divided by 2 and the wave function is equal to 0 at that point, so we say that that is a knot of the wave function over here. Now, fortunately for us, I've already sketched the wave functions for n equals to 1, 2, 3, knowing that n 
equals to zero does not exist. So psi one, psi two, psi three is given by all these things over here. Now let's see whether this theorem holds for our um, unsymmetric infinite square. Well, n equals to one is the ground state, correct? So we will know that the wave function of a one-dimensional bound state will have n minus one naught. So psi one, so n equals to one, at one minus one is zero, it will have zero knots within the region. Is that correct? No, that is correct because psi one is sketched out like this. No knots within the region over here. n equals to two, psi two is given by that. How many knots will we have? We will have two minus one knots. So what we were are left with is one knot and yes, the knot exists over here. Theorem holds. So far so good. n equals to three, two, two knots. Psi, uh, psi 3 is given by this over here, the dotted line, the knot, there's one over here and there's one over here. Yes, two knots for psi equals 3. So the theorem holds. Now, what is all these things about discussing about all these knots? Well, this is linked to the probability density function, which we'll talk very soon, okay? But before that, we'll go to point number 4.